Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. G'day everyone, it's great to be back. And I am, we're just about to start a church service, so can we bow in a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for this time together. We pray that you would make your presence known to us and that we would know your touch upon our lives as we look at your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's great to be back, as I said, and we were away on holidays and um, we just we went to a little place called Tumut. Some of you may know where Tumut is, a little country town that is um, near Gundagai. Um, and it is just a beautiful place, just a beautiful place. We stayed in some little cabins on a on a farm property and we um, we just enjoyed the time there out in the country. Beautiful place. Took many good photos. So we've been looking at Genesis 22. Well, actually, we've been looking at Genesis 21, but in Genesis 22, we come to another um, very difficult passage of Scripture. And so we're not going to avoid it, but we're going to look at it. Um, it's about Abraham and Isaac. And I've called this first part of Genesis 22... God, what are you thinking? She was ferocious and yet frail. When I told her that I was a chaplain, she took the opportunity to bombard me with accusations and questions. What is the use of prayer, she said, if God was going to let those 29 miners die. All those good people prayed around the clock for those miners and yet they died. What use is prayer, she said. She was referring to the mining disaster on the 30th of November 2010. We could say the same thing today. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Look around at the news reports. The death toll in Morocco has topped 2,900 people, while Libya counts at least 5,300 people killed in catastrophic flooding. The death toll keeps rising. Huge fires sweep. Over Hawaii, more than 50 people have died and hundreds of homes have been destroyed. Officials say that it could take years or even longer to repair the damage. Well, I don't know the answers, but I do know that many people have the idea that God is some kind of genie in a bottle who needs to do their bidding. But when their world is going smoothly, then they don't want anything to do with him. You see, the truth is that it is only when I do his bidding, when I come under his authority, 
when I enter into relationship with him, when I love and trust in him, that I find the perspective that I need to be able to pray for the answers that I need in my world and in my life. And living a life of faith is not always easy, but God sometimes has other plans for me and for this world that I don't have any idea about. Abraham discovered this in Genesis 22. If you wonder why God doesn't do anything about fires, floods and earthquakes, then you will be shocked when you come to Genesis 22. In this passage, God asks Abraham to sacrifice his only son as a bird offering, even though at the last minute he actually stops him. Now, why would God ask somebody to kill their own son and then stop him at the last minute? If you were looking for evidence or justification that God is not concerned about mankind or that he's dispassionate and sometimes brutal, then here it is. Or is it? Why would God be so callous and uncaring as to trick somebody into thinking that taking a human life is what he desires and then wait until the last minute to tell him that it isn't? Vivid. Brutal, dispassionate, distressing to the point of being traumatic for those involved, especially Isaac. God, what were you thinking? Well, that's the question that we'll be exploring over the next few weeks. This passage shocks me, but as I look a little bit further, there is more going on than I'm aware of at first. As I look at the whole story, I can discover some possible reasons God is asking Abraham to kill his only son and then intervene and stop him before he actually does. The first reason has to do with loving God. Isaac is now a young man and Abraham has grown to love him. And all of a sudden, God says, take your son, your only son. Yes, Isaac, whom you love so much and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. Is God testing Abraham's ultimate allegiance at this point in time in history? Is he saying, Is there anything that you would not be willing to sacrifice in order to obey me? Who or what do you put before me? Who do you love most? Because you will be called upon to obey me often in the future without question. It appears that love is related to obedience. You see, Jesus confirms this when he said in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, obey my commandments. Is my love for God going to be a preeminent factor in how I live my life? When it comes to the crunch, who and what governs my responses to life? Deuteronomy 6 and verse 5 puts it this way, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your strength. For Abraham, that is the key question. He knows God's voice. God loves him, and he loves God, trusts him, and obeys him. Before I can understand any other reason for what appears to be a gruesome request, that's where I must start with a wholehearted, genuine commitment to loving God above all else and knowing that God wants the very best for me because he loves me. My love drives my obedience to complete that which my faith has begun. My trust in God and my obedience to his word is derived from my love for him. 
How can I experience that kind of love? Well, 1 John 4 verse 19 says, We love because he first loved us. Despite our crazy world of violence and sinful behaviours, he loves us. And when I enter into relationship with God, it's because I realise that he loved me so much that he sent his only son to die on a cross, a cruel and gruesome death, in order to pay the penalty for my sins and yours. I respond to that message by coming under his authority and giving my life to him. Jesus tells me in John 14 and verse 23 that all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. So firstly, Without love, there can be no relationship with God and no obedience to his word. Without love, there can be no secure reason to trust in God when my world seems at times to be falling apart. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God prepared for those who love him. But is that enough? Sure, love and trust is the basis for obedience to God, but there's more to this story than loving and trusting in God's love for us. Let's look at our crazy world today. There's Plenty of evidence of blatant disregard for human life today. Terrorism and suicide bombers and capital punishment and human trafficking and total disregard for the sanctity of human life. So can we find some other things in this story to discover what God is thinking when he asks Abraham to take his only son, the son he loves, and to sacrifice him as a burnt offering? I know that he stops him at the last minute, but what is going on here? If he is making a point of some kind, then it seems to be a pretty extreme and cruel way to get the message across. And, and what is the message anyway? I think this story can also show me and you that God is demonstrating in a dramatic way that human sacrifice of any kind is wrong. Is that the point that he's trying to drive home to Abraham? But then again, if this point is to say that human life is valuable, then what about those miners who died recently or the soldiers in Afghanistan or the fires in Hawaii? Weren't, they, weren't those lives valuable? We prayed for them, some people around the clock. If God is trying to stress the value of human life, then it seems to me an odd way to go about it. Is there more to this story than that? Well, the second thing that this passage teaches me and perhaps you is found in another question. The question is not, why did God allow those miners to die or those soldiers in Afghanistan to sacrifice those, those lives? But perhaps, why does he allow any of us to live at all when we've messed up his world so much by our sin? We are the ones who continue to allow bad things to happen to good people. We don't seem to appreciate the far-reaching implications of our sin. Romans 6 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. So why doesn't God wipe out the human race? Well, I can only go back to Ezekiel 18 and 23, where God asks, do you think that I like to see wicked people die? Says the sovereign Lord. Of course not. I want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. The Bible says the judgment is real and it will come to everyone at some point in the future. 2 
Peter 3.9 says the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Sacrificing a human life is not the point here, as, hor as horrific as that is, and as abhorrent to the Lord as it is. We need to realise that it's by grace, undeserved favour, that any of us are here at all. God does not like looking upon evil and wants our repentance. But there is something else going on in this passage. Why would God ask Abraham to sacrifice his only son, whom he loved as a burnt offering, only to stop him at the last second? We don't have enough time to examine this today. So we're going to continue this next week when we ask once again, God, what are you thinking right now? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your grace in our lives, that you don't just simply wipe us all out because of our sin. We thank you, Father, that you have a purpose for your world. You have a purpose for us individually. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. So we pray that as we look at this passage in Genesis 22 about Abraham and Isaac, that you would help us to come to grips with some of the aspects of your character and your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, church, we've chosen a difficult passage to examine. But in the next couple of weeks, I hope that you'll come to some other conclusions and that you would really see what God is trying to say to us. God bless you. Have a great day.